Hello again, my name is Vincent Faney. I am the author of Zen and the Art of Resistance Training, a yogic and scientific approach to weightlifting, weight training, and uh, it's a 600 page training manual, and I, within it, are broken up into smaller standalone sections. Actually, each chapter is kind of a standalone pearl of thought. Now, the, but the, basically the big um, sections I have are, aside from kinesiology and a whole encyclopedia portion of the book of uh, exercises and how to do them, I have a section on the book that deals with uh, the human um, intelligence and, and um, motivation and uh, belief systems and so forth and so on. And um, many people out there, I don't make any judgments about religion one way or another, I'm, um, uh, I'm a seeker. Uh, I have no fundamentalist views on anything regarding religion. I keep an open mind, and um, uh, but uh, you know, regardless of views or not, from atheists to the most uh, uh, die-hard fundamentalists, there are some people who have what, what we could uh, be better term uh, as mystical events, spiritual events. Mm, friend, uh, Doctor, formerly uh, Doctor uh, Lee Selena. He, he basically called these neurological events. He was a neurologist and uh, the, you know, great guy. He passed away some years ago, unfortunately. Had a few interesting talks of him. Now, I'm going to start off with the belief system, and this is very important to get this consideration. John C. Lilly, M.D., was a famous explorer in consciousness, had was famous for the saying. I'll read it to you right here. In the province of the mind, whatever is believed to be true is true or becomes true within certain limits to be found experimentally or experientially experientially these limits are further beliefs these limits are further beliefs that are to be transcendent in the province of the mind there are no limits that was John C. Lilly now what he was saying is that like obviously you know um, you gotta be careful there's some people who believe that uh, that their, their belief in God or whatever is so strong they could pour gasoline on themselves and light themselves on fire and survive. Now, that's a risk I wouldn't take. I believe in disinhibiting the mind by having certain beliefs or fantasies in the mind. Years ago, I just came up with a number because uh, certain scientists said the human potential was this, this, and this. And they were kind of comparing us to chimpanzees or whatever primates of the same weight. And that a person of X amount of weight weighing 150 pounds, there's no reason a person weighing 150 pounds or whatever shouldn't be, be able to do, you know, a um, 600-pound bench and, and be proportionally strong in every area uh, ratio to that. And I, I see no reason not to believe that because, well, I mean, I have hard evidence to support my beliefs. For instance, chimpanzees are stronger than the, some of the stronger men on the planet. And, uh, you know, they are not robots, they're not cyborgs, they have, their muscles are not any different. I mean, some of their leverages are better because of tendon attachments, but they are still, their muscles are, are like our muscles. We have muscles, they have muscles. The same biology of those muscles. Now, obviously, evolution has uh, caused their, um, to, their, their bodies to have, uh, for survival of the fittest, to start off strong without having to train. Now, you could train uh, even primates to be stronger than what they are, but basically they are come out of the chute, so to speak, very strong. They're closer to their 100% potential, far closer than what human beings who are just scratching the surface. And then the issue of people uh, exerting enormous amounts of strength, superhuman feats of strength, to save someone, their child pinned under a car and so forth. These are documented cases. Now, obviously, uh, those people often suffer crushed vertebrae and, and, and permanent damage sometimes and uh, when they you know when they lift because they're not trained now the object of a lifter is to that who you know has the belief is to to try to become as strong as a chimpanzee on command at their own self command so you gotta you gotta believe it no one's going to be able to get any very far in weightlifting and say oh let's see I'm benching 90 pounds I'll never bench 200 never 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 every day they tell themselves that they simply won't get stronger it's going to be drudgery. Now, I've seen one or two rare people who have gotten fairly strong, respectably strong, despite their negative programming. You know, I had a friend who started lifting weights. He could barely do 95 pounds for three reps when he started. And his hope was that he would one day, when fresh, all conditions being right, stars aligned, bench 200 for one rep. And I assured him not only would he be doing that, he would not only, he'd be not just working out with 200, he would end up using it as a warm-up weight. And 
This guy eventually, not only would he use that as a warm-up weight for many, many, many reps, he actually benched twice his body weight with very long arms in his 30s, uh, close to 40s. And he benched, uh, yeah, he went from nowhere to uh, benching twice his body weight without a bench shirt and without steroids and very long arms and so forth and so on. And mainly because he, you know, he, every time he hit a wall when I said, you're going to bench this, he would say, well, maybe my potential is 250. And he'd be at like 200. Then, every, you know, on his own, every now and then, he'd increase his, he'd have to admit that his potential is more by increments. And so, you know, he had to concede, and that belief that he could reach just 25 pounds more was enough to help him. Me, I read from the beginning, from though, that, uh, you know, I have within me a 2,000-pound bench and all this other stuff. So, obviously, getting to 400 or whatever is like a piece of cake, because that's just dipping your foot in the water a little bit. Now, I want to talk about the proper combinations of um, certain train optimal uh, combination of factors for training. And it just just give you just to so you get categorized. It's very important to be able to organize your thought towards certain things to peg your um, items to peg your mind on. And you, you got to have an optimal combination of training methods, meaning how to train your fast twitch, your slow twitch, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, different uh, addressing all the strength uh, types of strength that there are, uh, training all your energy systems. You got to have a combination. You, you can't. Very, very few people go very far on a five sets of five, five sets of five reps, or on just only heavy duty lifting, or on negative only or isometrics. There's a whole array of weapons I call them, training tools that you need to use. Uh, you got to have optimal nutrition. That doesn't mean you need to spend tons of money at your bodybuilding uh, supplement store. You know, that's that just eat good. A lot of people spend tons of money on supplementation. Uh, throwing stuff in without getting the um, the right ratio of relatively inexpensive macronutrients, the right combination of protein, carbohydrates, and proper fats. And to me, that's like putting in a fuel additive without putting a fuel into your car. Well, how far are you going to go? Not very far. So on the hierarchy of what you must do, um, training, optimal nutrition, conservative supplementation, proper rest and restoration, many of the techniques is, is very essential, sleep, like when I train a high volume, I really don't need much more calories or supplementation, but for me, I, I need more cat naps. I'll sleep, if I'm going really heavy and extensive in every way, I could sleep two extra hours a night, up to two hours a night, and even get a couple extra cat naps a day. Now, I'm not, my body really doesn't need calories as much as it needs uh, the rest and restoration. Now, again, optimal mental, emotional, and spiritual and mystical programming. Now, I'm a little nervous about mystic, uh, mystical spiritual. I, I kind of like it. The reason why I use it is because that's what really um, communicates. It gets across to some people. They understand that they're not they're not very comfortable with scientific terms because they feel that's too dry and artificial. Anyways, um, there's a lot of people that I've talked to. I mean, a lot of this may sound like some uh, airy fairy crystal crystal kissing kind of stuff, and they're not comfortable with it. But I want to say, over the years, I have communicated with um, many of these people here. Uh, I communicated with Sufi Initiate. He's no longer around. He's passed away a couple earlier 2000s. Uh, Peter Velayat and I Khan. And there are many people who are in the creme of the creme of the academic world who believe as I do. There's the Dr. Uh, there's Joseph Chilton Pierce, an educator. He wrote the book uh, Cracking the Cosmic Egg and so forth and the potential of our mind and the how our brain is often uh, doesn't work as effectively in modern society. We we, we close the our open data potential by refusing to see how almost limitless we are. Dan Millman, I have never talked with him personally. I mean I've you know we I've emailed him requesting certain things. He's I, I love this guy, world champion gymnast, martial artist, he's done martial arts, he's a uh, talking about the helping people to extend to the human potential. You got Stanislav Groff, M D. Now Stanislav Groff used to have clinics in Czechoslovakia and he used to be a um, a director of the psychiatric department. He's a psychiatrist, and that's a psychiatrist is beyond a psychologist. They, they're a, a medical doctor who prescribe drugs. Sometimes some of them can do surgery and so forth. He's uh, so sharp and so competent and respected in this field. He was a director of the psychiatry department at John Hopkins. Now he does this stuff. He's um, realizing that he used to use LSD in, in therapy and so forth, minor degrees under certain controlled instances. Now. 
using, uh, he wrote the holotropic uh, brain and so forth and so on. Many good books. So a lot of his ideas relate to my ideas and how I approach weightlifting. And if you, you know, read the book, you'll understand what that means. There's Anthony Robbins. Everybody's heard of Anthony Robbins. He's been acted, played himself uh, in a couple of movies like um, Shallow How, big motivational speaker. He understands how it's necessary to meld uh, in a logical way the use of your emotions to do something logical because uh, as he's found simply being intellectual and logical doesn't help a lot of people. A lot of people need the juice of their emotions. They need to use their emotions logically to get what needs to be done for logical reasons and vice versa. They used to need their logic to feel emotionally, use their logic to feel uh, be emotion, do, feel emotionally appropriate emotions. There's Dr. M. Scott Peck, M.D., passed away. I've interrelated with him over the internet quite a few times. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, Ph.D., I asked him permission to um, use some of his ideas, and uh, basically his ideas when I read his books and heard, saw his research, amazing stuff, please Google him. I um, showed how his research and his ideas Related to what I found to be true in weightlifting in the in the province of the mind, Dr. Charles Tart, the same thing. He was a uh, professor at Berkeley and then went to now in Davies, I believe. And he's hanging out. A lot of these guys are hanging out together because some of these guys are starting to um, entertain the thought of survival of the body and how that relates to the quantum field. There's some people who are bold. Religious people are so bold as to believe that's what Jesus was trying to t say when he talked about resurrection or something like that. I, again, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a, th you know, religious scholar, so I just, this is something I heard, so, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. Dr. Lee Salina, he was a neurologist, and uh, he wrote a good book called Kundalini Rising, things that we experience at a certain age, and Chilton Pierce also talks about stuff like this, and all these guys talk about these neurological events that uh, are named uh, with a mystical term, Kundalini Rising, and uh, he's very careful that, you know, not all mystical events, or, or you know, he, believe, he calls them neurological events, which I like. And then, of course, there are some people like Chilton Pierce and um, Vilay Khan say, well, neurological event, what's the, I mean, there's no difference, that's, you know, that's what, a, yeah, that is a mystical event, I mean, that's just a different name, a scientific name, so I let those guys battle it out. Dr. Carl Pil Pilgrim, who wrote the uh, holographic mind and uh, interesting stuff talks about how we are the universe or consciousness for Jeff Copper the the, the uh, Dow of physics and uh, many other good books turning point and so forth Ram Das and Robert Sternberg who deals with intelligence and Howard Gardner all these guys who have researched and read and, and even um, had the audacity to write them or to call them up Dr. Chilton uh, Pierce, Joseph Shilton Pierce, I had a, a talk with a guy for like over an hour when he was pretty excited about my book and how I would, uh, you know, look at weightlifting, quite frankly, as a tool of transcendence. And as an equation, you know, you have on this side, transcending a spirit and mind and um, using tools that disinhibit your inhibition, uh, any, any restraints or limits you place on yourself. And then over here, you, you have exercise in the physical world. You, you physically do stuff here. And if you, you know, my theory is, um, my experiences are, if you stimulate and, and really push yourself to certain limits, it causes transcendence over here, like a, a mystical events um, and uh, uh, a releasing of energy and entwining of energy. And, and basically, there's a profound change you feel here, this experience, all of a sudden, You'll no, that you notice that over here you become augmented on the physical end and your your what was once impossible in strength and, and speed or this and that in increments you know you're going forward and it's good that these uh, increments happen instead of going straight out because some people who get strength too fast regardless if they're on steroids or not and that usually happens more in steroids will usually blow out their tendons rupture their tendons so that's why it's not good but basically all these things comes down to Enlightenment, and enlightenment is uh, also a, a fancy way of saying, you know, you understand the rational mind should be supreme. People tend to default to mysticism at the expense of rational thought. And so one thing I like about these scientists here, these are all empirical 
they experiment, they're experiential, they're intellectual, they have the rational mind, but yet they they feel safe enough to entertain and to really get into believing certain things because they think that the mind, the beliefs, um, will open open some doors. And uh, so I'm not really explaining that very well, but I think uh, some when I have explained to some people, they understand what I'm saying. So uh, things I, I write more about this in the book, and there's just too much right now to just on you know to do it on tape. Okay. Nothing can resist the human will that will stake even its existence on its stated purpose. And that's ben, you know, Benjamin um, Desirelli, I believe his name is. Now, you know, Sufi initiate Pirit Vilayat and Ayat Khan believe that we're also our bodies. We're not just our spirit, okay? The bodies are the vehicle, both our intellect and our spiritual being. Now, since our bodies are both vehicles and temples of our mind, or intellect, and of our spiritual being, then I believe it makes sense that we should take the best care of our bodies. And uh, many spiritual disciplines focus on using the body as an instrument to bring about enlightenment. That's what I do. They use the body to learn what it's like to live in the present. And from here, you can learn to reign in our, your intellect. That's what we need to do. We have to sometimes our, our intellect becomes a runaway power tool. Think, 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 think. Worry, worry, worry. And we've got to quit that. Now, these spiritual teachers understand the importance of sometimes using the body to integrate mind, body, and spirit. Now, I believe when the body's neglected, everything else goes by the wayside. Unless, of course, you're an avatar such as Buddha or Christ, and, you know, we have no way of knowing that is for sure. This pretty much leaves most of us out. Now, to further illustrate the importance of our bodies, let me share a story from history. In a recent and tragic period of our history during, the War War II, during World War II, the turnkeys at some of the concentration camps understood this all too well about how our, we are our bodies and how we could uh, basically... Degenerate if we break our bodies. They, they knew the cause and effect of ruining the body. They had a saying: "Break the body, break the spirit, break the heart." And I got to say, a lot of us are guilty of breaking our own bodies. Or you know, the breaking is often done by extreme negligence, gross neglect, uh, ne negligence of symptomatic, symptomatic of dysfunctional behavior. So I mean, people just don't start destroying their bodies because they're mentally healthy. They have great lives going on. They basically, it's because they got some dysfunctions, and many of the self-defeating thoughts and behaviors they have filled with fear and anger and anxiety, self-consciousness and perfectionism, uh, stubbornness, lack of motivation, overcompetitiveness. They have so many distractions, a lack of persistence. All these things get in the way. Now, jealousy, for instance, which is a, um, a combination of fear and anger, and a fear, of fear of loss and anger, resentment of other people having more. There are often people who say, well, I love you even though I'm jealous of you. And that's, that's crap because, quite frankly, um, jealousy is like, a, it's like carbon monoxide and oxygen compete for hemoglobin. They can't share it. You cannot have optimal amount of oxygen when you have um, carbon monoxide in the bloodstream. So it'll crowd it out. Okay? And that's what jealousy is like with love. If you have a relationship where there's jealousy, jealousy competes heavily with love. And you cannot fully love somebody if you're jealous or resentful of that person. You know, it's, it's kind of chaotic. It's like a, it, your biocomputer starts getting sluggish and slowing down because it starts to drag. Because it's, it, it, they're, they're um, conflicting programs. And so I, I had a saying that uh, love cannot flower in the soil of jealousy. You know, and that's, that's pretty much true. Now, um... One thing I want to say, uh, just a friend of mine, Neo, said this, and this is not a, a original, it's just his way of saying it. Uh, what you think affects how you feel and perform. Training your brain is as important as training your body. All right? And the, the whole idea, Don Shula would say, the whole idea is to get an edge. Sometimes it takes just a little extra something to get that edge. Uh, you know, and that's it. it just so, that's, that's that. Now, uh, next time I talk to you, we'll talk about Chapter 6, The Biology of Transcendence, The First Matrix of Psychic Phenomena. We'll discuss uh, some of the potentialities with that. Now, just remember, if all this stuff you're uncomfortable with, and you're just saying, look, I don't want to hear any of this stuff. I just want to train hard. I will say this, that I've used my belief systems. John C. Lilly has also said that um, our beliefs, uh, that our, 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 our human primate brains are so inferior that sometimes many people need to have childish, imaginative uh, beliefs that may be somewhat flawed and use it as a tool to evolve. And then we have to disregard 
uh, that belief or at least tweak it or, or uh, um, improve upon it, enhance it, augment it, and go further. Even, and uh, you know, some people would poo-poo that idea and say, well, if it's flawed, you shouldn't be messing with it. It's flawed whatsoever. Well, I would argue that the uh, Greeks had many geometric and mathematical theorems that they utilized quite wonderfully if you look at their buildings and their structures and so forth. And it wasn't until the 17 or 1800s when another mathematician proved that many of these theorems were flawed. So I would say if, you know, going by this uh, person's logic that I know, if you were to, like, say that you shouldn't even anything that has a flaw to it, a piece that's flawed, then it's, it's worthless. I say we can, as uh, intelligent primates, cherry pick, ignore certain flaws and say we'll work from here, we'll go further, and uh, we'll do that. Oh, that's Dr. Robert Schubert Steinberg. I did a big O. Sorry about that. Anyways, um, that's just something I want to kind of put out there to you. And uh, also about the training, like hypnosis. I, the program that I set forward works on its own merit, you know, without using any self-hypnosis or visualization or any belief systems. So when I, I decided for a while to simply just be a mechanic, I still made these incredible gains. I made better gains on that than I did with using self-hypnosis on inferior training programs. But my self-hypnosis did help me to push and make improvements on inferior training programs. The problem, you've got to be careful with belief systems and, and, and self-hypnosis, is it could cause you, if you go reach too far, too, it could, it could, if you're not careful, you could reach too far too fast, and your body can be go beyond what it's really healthy to do. That's why it's good to have a good, be a good mechanic and have a good training program. All right, bye for now. Talk to you later, and chapter six. Uh, have a good day.